dream. One day, this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its dreams. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created in. Black men thinking, thinking. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. Black men thinking. Anytime you throw your weight behind a political party that controls two-thirds of the government and that party can't keep the promise that it made to you during election time and you are dumb enough to walk around continuing to identify yourself with that party, you're not only a chump, but you're a traitor to your race. Black men thinking. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. And this idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no other source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and the most unique idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. Black men thinking, thinking. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Black men thinking. Stanley thinking, Levy, Black Man thinking, thinking, here on the dominant force of internet conservatism, TalkAmericaRadio.us, also WDDQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia, WJHC, Talk 107.5 in North Florida, Freedom in America Radio dot com and WLBB News Talk AM thirteen thirty in Carrollton, Georgia. Uh, happy September eleventh anniversary, and I do say happy because we're still here. The purpose of that attack was to bring America down. It did not, and the fact that we're having this many anniversaries of that day is a testament to American resilience and resolve. The event was tragic. The remembrance should be somber. But that there is an America 16 day, 16 years, excuse me, after someone tried by attacking us openly, violently, and in an unprecedented manner, we're still here. Happy anniversary. Along the themes of things that are disastrous, let's talk a little bit about hurricanes. There are some things that um, hurricanes, when they are, when they arrive, they tend to adjust people's thinking. They tend to make you forget certain things. When you are first world status and you have a tendency to believe that you are on top of everything, and you tend to believe that you have conquered the world. And that is kind of how we live here in the United States. We're very pampered. But then something comes along like hurricanes. Hurricane Harvey, which is still doing work in the Gulf of Mexico, the images that came from that were shocking to say the least. The one that sticks out in my mind more than any other, was seeing the floodwaters reach to the bottom of a sign above an interstate highway, past the overpass. So we're talking about 15 feet of water, standing water, making an interstate highway impassable, uh, to put it mildly, impassable. Those are the type of things that will create perspective if you don't already have it. And when those things happen, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that happens uh, or should happen. You get out of first world thinking very quickly when the first world is washed away or submerged. And then we get back to some base things. And the problem with the base things is the, po- the folks who end up back 
to less than first world standards aren't the ones who continue to publicize nonsense. Because in Houston, in the wake of Harvey, we have activists going out and talking about who's planting stories about looting. They're saying there's black race-based looting. And you can go and see any number of things about that that just don't make sense. But we need to do a quick fact check because what they would have you believe is that, one, there's no looting and black people would never loot in the aftermath of a flood. Well, the Daily Caller uh, published an article. This was uh, back on, I'm trying to find this. Uh, this was back on August 28th. Reports of looting in Houston, Texas has surfaced in the wake of the devastation left by Hurricane Harvey. Yeah, they have. As citizens uh, of the city wade through flood water, pouring rain to assess damage caused by natural disasters, some looters have taken the opportunity to criminally enrich themselves by stealing property left behind in retail shops, abandoned homes. A handful of looters have even been arrested since the reports surfaced. Many of them fake. The reports are fake, but the arrests are not, which, spe uh, which spread like wildfire. The uh, reports did, the fake reports did. They even use old pictures. This is a time-honored tactic of social media activism to find something, a, a picture that illustrates the point you're trying to make, even though the picture you are using is not of the time, of the place, or even about the incident. It just gives the right impression. However, there is looting. But there's an issue if you want to loot in Texas. I'm just going to let you know. Um, here's how Fox News reported on someone who had something to say about those who wanted to loot or continue to loot following the arrival of Hurricane Harvey. Thank you, Clayton. All right, now to a Fox News alert. Thousands already dealing with the worst natural disaster in U.S. history. They now have a whole new concern, looters. You come down the street looking for problems, you're going to get shot. <laughs> That's pretty blunt. We're seeing signs like this pop up all over the place, but some refusing to become a target once again, and they have a stern warning to thieves. You heard it. If you loot, we shoot. Griff Jenkins is live in Asaposita, Texas, where neighbors are armed and ready. Did I get that name right, Griff? That's right. It's Astacita. And if you're thinking about looting on Labor Day in this uh, neighborhood, you might want to think twice because they're very serious about that. People have been dr bringing their uh, belongings out of these flooded homes. Obviously, the waters have receded. But as cars have driven by and filtered through uh, these people's belongings, they try to sort out the worst devastation they faced in, in their lives in many cases. They're not going to tolerate this sort of stuff. Look at the sign behind me. You loot, we shoot. And that Soundbite you just had from Ryan Pizzatola and his friend Brad Bolonic. Here's exactly what they experienced yesterday in the message they wanted to reinforce. Some guys came through with a trailer looking to take some stuff, and we shut it down and said, hey, it's not the place. If they want to take it from me, it's going to be bad news for them. This is the sign in Ryan's front yard. Nothing inside worth dying for. You will see the accurate shots as if it were a shooting target. So while these signs are perhaps colorful, the message is very serious, and they don't want people coming through. This comes as Mayor Turner uh, of Houston is trying to get debris moved. There are also some signs that say, uh, my home, not trash, to indicate uh, even the, the trash services, as services start to come back on, that here people are trying to go. In fact, if we have a moment, just pan over, you can see people have to pull the, the belongings, the chesters, the couches, the, the things that uh, they can salvage out into the yard to dry, and also they're going to have to have some time to sort through them. The mayor also on the Sunday shows saying that his meeting with the president was very good, and what they talked about was just the issue of the debris and housing assistance. The folks here, though, are not going to be looted on Labor Day, guys. Griff, thanks a lot. Thank I mean, so looters, they made that clear. looters beware. Texas not the right place to do it. Right. No, Texas is not the right place to go and act crazy. Um, they will shoot you there. Oh, by the way, Florida, which is now experiencing Hurricane Irma, is also a place where people have no issue being armed. 
So if folks tend to want to act up in the wake of that, you may see some issues there. Um, but the activists would have you believe that this is race-based. It's not. It's opportunistic-based. There may be more of one race than another doing it. But the issue is very clear. Don't steal from people when they're down. But hurricanes tend to make you forget that because they're not saying we're going to shoot black looters. We're going to say, if you, I mean, we don't care who you are, you're going to have a problem. Another thing that hurricanes make you forget is to stop listening to lies about American divisions, including race divisions. That's kind of hard for people, but again, we're looking at the Hurricane Harvey situation since we don't have enough time elapsed since the uh, landfall of Irma. Chicago Tribune, August 28th, tragedies like the one unfolding in Texas as rain continues to fall have a way of peeling layers off people until only their humanity remains. That's what you need to hear. You don't see videos of people squabbling. You see regular people becoming heroes and stranded people accepting help with tears and elation. Um, a story by Matt Pierce of the L.A. Times described it this way. Across Texas, there were reports of citizens mobilizing with boats and boots to help pull people from the ri rising waters. Social media lit up with a video posted by a reporter from KARK -K News in which a man from Texas City, Texas, was preparing to deploy a small boat. I'm going to try to save some lives. That man is black. I don't imagine that made a lick of difference to the people he went to help. There's also a picture of a white gentleman carrying a black child piggyback through waist-deep floodwaters. Now, if you want to believe that the division that you have been ta uh, told about Non-stop by the media, almost every political story that you see in media, it leads with the idea that we are a divided country. All you need is something like this to basically put that whole narrative in check. Unless, of course, you're Barack Obama. Barack Obama, you may not you may remember, not remember this, and all of the Barack Obama fans conveniently forget. Back in 2016, about three months before the election, Louisiana went through some tremendous flooding. There was not a hurricane, just very heavy rain. Barack Obama took his time about visiting. I mean, he just didn't go. But he did issue a 16-page guidance to warn people about unlawful discrimination on the basis of race, color, or... Na he didn't visit to survey the damage to let people know what the government was going to do for them if it needed to do anything or what resources would be available. Y'all just don't discriminate against anybody. Really? While he goes and plays golf or something. And that ticked off some people, including Rod Dreher uh, of the American Conservative, who said, everywhere you look, you can find black folks and white folks loving on each other, helping each other through this crisis. And he criticized the Obama memo because you have to remember, pro progressives like the idea of division. It helps to advance their narrative of everything is bad about America. And only if you come along to our way of thinking will things improve. The other thing that hurricanes make you forget, last thing I'm going to talk about with this, is who else actually suffers in a natural disaster? Because we tend, we tend to think that only certain people suffer. The uh, Guardian UK publication ran an article uh, that w was talking about landlords demanding rent on flooded Houston homes with the idea, of course, of of playing the haves versus the have-nots. And how can they do this to these people? They don't have anything. You act as though everybody who's renting a house out to someone is a millionaire. They're not. It may be their business, but it's still a small business. And the interesting thing about displaced families who are renting they can take whatever belongings they can 
they can salvage and they can go someplace else and start anew. Whoever owns that property doesn't have that flexibility at all. Whoever owns that property, if they don't own it outright, I guarantee you that the bank has not said, oh, your property is flooded, the one we loaned you hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy. Well, we understand that you have a problem, but we still want that payment. I do not believe the counties in Texas or elsewhere, although it would be nice if they did, are going to suspend the collection of property taxes on those homes and other properties simply because they are buried under water. The have-nots aren't suffering like that. Well, they have the money. No, they don't necessarily have the money. They simply have the problem, and they have to figure out a way to get that problem resolved. Everybody is hurt when a natural disaster strikes. To try to divide them into categories so that you can say one is abusing another when all are in the same barrel of pain is obscene. Hurricanes tend to make you forget certain things but it doesn't ever deter progressives from their destructive mission. When the first world goes away in America, the humanity comes forward. If you're paying attention, you will see it. If you're watching mainstream news, you'll think we're a bunch of savages. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking. We'll be back right after this. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, here on the dominant force of Internet Conservative, TalkAmericaRadio.us, also WDDQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia, WJHC, Talk 107.5 in North Florida, FreedomInAmericaRadio.com, and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. Uh, again, happy anniversary, surviving 9-11, and also, um, as we remember, those in Florida, uh, particularly since one of the stations that carries uh, our show, uh, WJHC Talk 1075, is in that state, and they are going to be in for difficult times. Moving on to our next topic, though, uh, DACA, the nothing that means everything to some. Let's be clear, we understand uh, DACA. Because there is a lot of misinformation out there. Um, DACA, which stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. So there is no action. It is deferring an action. That action that was being deferred was deportation in accordance with existing law. They are illegal immigrants. And as a result... Illegal immigrants are to be deported in accordance with U.S. immigration law. If you're not here legally, you're not supposed to stay here. So let's make sure we understand that. DACA is not a law. Neither is it an executive order. It is simply an immigration policy that was put forth, not even, let me read you the document that actually puts DACA in place. It was written or issued on June 15th of 2012, not by the White House, not by the Justice Department, but by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. At the time, the secretary of that department was Janet Napolitano. That will become interesting later on. By this memorandum, well, subject... Subject is exercising prosecutorial prosecutorial discretion with respect to individuals who came to the United States as children. Discretion. It's a policy, not a law, not an order. By this memorandum, I, who is I, Secretary Napolitano, then Secretary Napolitano, I am setting forth how in the exercise of our prosecutorial discretion, struggling with that word today, the Department of Homeland Security should enforce the nation's immigration laws against certain young people who were brought to this country as children 
and know only this country as home. Stop. Here's how we're going to enforce the laws. This is the we're going to use our prosecutorial discretion. It's not that they have not violated the law. We are choosing not to prosecute them for violating law. Stop. The following criteria should be satisfied before an individual is considered for an exercise of prosecutorial discretion pursuant to this memorandum. Came to the United States under the age of 16. Has continuously resided in the U.S. for at least five years preceding the date of this memorandum and is in the United States on the date of this memorandum. Currently in school, graduated from high school, obtained a general education development certificate, or is an honorably discharged veteran of the Coast Guard or Armed armed Services of the U.S., has not been convicted of a felony, uh, a significant misdemeanor, multiple misdemeanors, or otherwise a threat to national security or public safety, and is not above the age of 30. So, you have to be under 30, be in the United States for five years, and if you meet these criteria, it's not that you are not guilty of violating immigration law. We have said we're going to carve out this group and we won't prosecute them. That is what DACA is about, period. Here's Barack Obama announcing this policy on the date that the memorandum was issued by Janet Napolitano. This morning, Secretary Napolitano announced new actions my administration will take to mend our nation's immigration policy, uh, to make it more fair, more efficient, and more just, specifically for certain young people, sometimes called dreamers. Now, these are young people who study in our schools, They play in our neighborhoods, they're friends with our kids, they pledge allegiance to our flag. They are Americans in their heart, in their minds, in every single way but one, on paper. They were brought to this country by their parents, uh, sometimes even as infants, and often have no idea that they're undocumented until they apply for a job or a driver's license, or a college scholarship. Put yourself in their shoes. Imagine you've done everything right your entire life. Studied hard, worked hard, maybe even graduated at the top of your class, only to suddenly face the threat of deportation to a country that you know nothing about, with a language that you may not even speak. That's what gave rise to the DREAM Act. It says that if your parents brought you here as a child, you've been here for five years, and you're willing to go to college or serve in our military, you can one day earn your citizenship. And I've said time and time and time again to Congress that send me the DREAM Act, put it on my desk, and I will sign it right away. Now, both parties wrote this legislation. And a year and a half ago, Democrats passed the DREAM Act in the House, but uh, Republicans walked away from it. It got 55 votes in the Senate, but Republicans blocked it. The bill hasn't really changed. The need hasn't changed. It's still the right thing to do. The only thing that has changed, apparently, uh, was the politics. Now, as I said in my speech on the economy yesterday, it makes no sense to expel talented young people who, for all intents and purposes, are Americans. They've been raised as Americans, understand themselves to be part of this country. To expel these young people who want to staff our labs or start new businesses or defend our country simply because of the actions of their parents or because of the inaction of politicians. This is the classic, well, forget the law and deal with the emotions. It's the right thing to do. Classic. However, when he was speaking to Univision, this same president indicated that this was exactly the wrong thing to do. With respect to uh, the notion that I can just suspend deportations through executive order, uh, that's just not the case uh, because there are laws on the books that Congress has passed. Congress passes the law. The executive branch's job is to enforce and implement those laws. And then the judiciary has to 
uh, interpret uh, the laws. There are enough laws on the books by Congress that are very clear in terms of how we have to enforce uh, our immigration system that for me to simply, through executive order, ignore those congressional mandates uh, would uh, not conform with my appropriate role as president. Which is why he did not e issue an executive order. He let DHS simply use its quote-unquote prosecutorial discretion as far as whom they pursued to put into removal proceedings. It is not a law. It is not an executive order. It is a memo issued by a cabinet member. And he chooses to endorse it so that he can keep his hands clean. Well, not being a legal action, there's no legislation supporting this. Matter of fact, it is basically exempting people from the consequences of legislation on the books. Donald Trump, in part of his program, of making America great again, and also what I call doing the serve pro routine to Barack Obama, making it like it never happened, had this announcement through the Attorney General back on the 5th of September. I'm here today to announce that the program known as DACA that was effectuated under the Obama administration is being rescinded. This unilateral executive amnesty among other things, contributed to a surge of minors at the southern border that yielded terrible humanitarian consequences. It also denied jobs to hundreds of thousands of Americans by allowing those same illegal aliens to take those jobs. To have a lawful system of immigration that serves the national interest, we cannot ha admit everyone who would like to come here. It's just that simple. The nation must set and enforce a limit on how many immigrants we admit each year, and that means all cannot be accepted. This does not mean they are bad people or that our nation disrespects or demeans them in any way. It means we are properly enforcing our laws as Congress has passed them. We are people of compassion and we are people of law. But there is nothing compassionate about the failure to enforce immigration laws. Enforcing the law saves lives protects communities and taxpayers, and prevents human suffering. Failure to enforce the laws in the past has put our nation at risk of crime, violence, and terrorism. The compassionate thing to do is end the lawlessness, enforce our laws, and if Congress chooses to make changes to those laws, to do so through the process set forth by our founders in a way that advances the interest of the American people. There are many powerful interest groups in the country, and every one of them has a constitutional right to advocate their views and represent whomever they choose. But the Department of Justice does not represent any narrow interest or any subset of the American people. We represent all the American people and protect the integrity of our Constitution. That is our charge. We at the Department of Justice are proud and honored to work to advance this vision for America and to do our best each day to ensure the safety and security of the American people. This is very simple. We have laws. We're a nation of laws. You have put together a program that is neither law or even executive order in an attempt to disrupt our national policy to disrupt our national conversation, to disrupt and destroy this country on the basis of immigration, not on law, but based on emotion. And you want that emotion to carry the day. We're dealing with 800,000 people who are part of this program, a federal program, not a federal law, not a federal executive order, a federal program set up by DHS which simply says we will not enforce the law with respect to these 800,000 people. And with that, you have set up all kinds of emotional arguments against enforcing the immigration laws of the United States, which was part of making us a great nation in the first place. This is the age-old progressive desire to pit emotion, which is the impetus of movement in a democracy, against law, which is the foundation of stability in a republic, so that they might pursue democracy instead 
of having a republic and therefore achieve the end of all the identity politics that they've been putting out there all along. Instead of having the United States be a nation made up of every kindred, tongue, and nation governed by law, they simply want it to be a mob that is governed by whatever group or coalition comes together to form a majority. There's a reason the founders did not create the United States federal government as a democracy. This is part of it. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking. We'll be back right after this. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, here on the dominant force in Internet conservatism, TalkAmericaRadio.us. Also, WDDQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia. WJHC, Talk 107.5 for our friends in North Florida. Godspeed to you. FreedomInAmericaRadio.com and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. I, I just want to finish up something um, out of that last segment talking about DACA. Two things I want to bring up. Interestingly, the president of the University of California has decided to sue the Trump administration about its planned rescission of DACA. Now, remember, it hasn't been rescinded. He gave them six months, but she's suing now because of the harm. Remember, DACA is not Obama's policy. It's hers, and that is Janet Napolitano. Also, the attorney general of California has called what Trump is doing unconstitutional. So taking away a program that is neither an executive order or a law is somehow unconstitutional unconstitutional in the mind of some idiot in California. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I didn't talk much about um, the race aspects of illegal immigration because that's not the important thing. Sovereignty is. If you don't belong here by the paperwork, then you simply don't belong here. Leave your race concerns for something else. On to the next topic. Did you know that we had a black Surgeon General. As a matter of fact, we've had three Surgeon Generals now um, as part of the Trump administration. One was a holdover from Barack Obama. And Trump, once again, has demonstrated for all the people who want to call him racist that he was more concerned about black excellence than Barack, Barack Obama ever was. Let's talk about the first guy who was there and was asked to resign by President Trump. United States Surgeon General Vivek Murthy said he has been replaced. His statement comes a little more than two years after he was confirmed under President Barack Obama. Murthy was the first Indian American appointed to the nation's top health post when he was confirmed by the Senate in 2014. His confirmation came a year after he was nominated. Murthy released a landmark report on addiction in November, saying dependency on opioids and other substances must not be looked at as a character flaw. It was the first publication from a Surgeon General that has addressed drug and alcohol addiction. Okay, he was gone. Took a year to confirm him because one of the problems he had is he was out there trying to tell people that gun violence was a health issue. Everybody got shot with a gun. That's not a, that's not a criminal issue. That's a health issue. Well, he's gone. Now, the interesting thing is Donald Trump, replaced him with the deputy secretary general who got heavily criticized by a lot of people because of her lack of qualifications. Now, take a listen to this, and then we'll talk about that on the other side. The Trump administration just replaced the country's top medical officer, the Surgeon General. And for the first time, it's someone who's not a medical doctor. Obama appointee Vivek Murthy was asked to resign Friday. His replacement, Rear Admiral Sylvia Trent Adams, a nurse who was serving as the Deputy Surgeon General. Trent Adams isn't the first nurse to hold the position, which doesn't actually require someone to be a physician. Surgeons General rarely make the news unless they challenge the president politically. 
Murthy made waves during his nomination because of his opinion that gun violence constitutes a public health threat. He's also been a vocal supporter of Obamacare. Trent Adams has worked in public health since 1992. She served as an Army nurse officer and holds a bachelor's degree in nursing, a master's degree in nursing and health policy, and a doctorate in philosophy. So let me get this straight. Oh, what it left out in there is the uh, young lady who took over for Murthy. She's a black woman. Did you hear about that? She's a rear admiral, a two-star general, effectively, in the U.S. military with a bachelor's, a master's, and a Ph.D., and she's black, and she was named as Surgeon General. Did you ever hear about that? I didn't think so. I didn't think so. Married black woman. Successful, obviously. But where, where, where was um, where were all the uh, the the progressive Negroes? Where was the Clown Brown Council, also known as the Congressional Black Caucus? Where were they applauding that? I didn't hear it. Where was CNN? who's always concerned about race issues and how black people are not being recognized for their accomplishments. Did they even record that one? I, I, hmm. I didn't hear it. Did you? I missed that. And then we have this happen on Tuesday, September 5th. To borrow a phrase from our president, let's all work together to make American health great again. Thank you very much. Dr. Jerome Adams is officially the nation's new Surgeon General. Vice President Mike Pence swore in the anesthesiologist to the position Tuesday. The ceremony was almost three years after then-Governor Pence tapped Adams to be Indiana's health commissioner. Pence praised Adams' efforts during his time in Indiana, including his work to combat high infant mortality rates, Ebola, and an opioid-fueled HIV outbreak. As I saw firsthand, uh, Dr. Jerome Adams has an extraordinary gift for empathy. And he brought that gift to his years in public service. Adams said during his confirmation hearing last month, he wants to put science ahead of politics in a, quote, sympathetic and empathetic way. And he vowed to focus on the U.S. opioid epidemic, untreated mental illness, and other difficult health problems. As the nation's doctor, Adams will advise Americans how they can be healthier and how they can reduce their risk of injury and illness. He will also oversee the Public Health Service Commissioned Corps. By the way, Dr. Jerome Adams, is a black man. Hello. Have you ha, are you, are you picking up on this? Let me get this straight. Barack Obama put Vivek Murthy, someone who was not born in America. He's naturalized, so okay. Someone who is not black, but of course he was president of all Americans. He's not he, he's not beholden to black Americans at all. Got it. Someone who supported Obamacare, which the a nation does not support, and someone who agreed with something that the nation does not agree with, which the nation does not agree, well, that gun violence should be handled as a public health issue as opposed to a criminal issue, criminal justice issue. That was Barack Obama's idea of a Surgeon General. Donald Trump said, thanks, but no thanks, you're gone. And he elevated the Deputy Secretary General, who was a black female with a Ph.D. And she was criticized as being just a nurse. Really? Where were, where were all the black females out there who always scream about um, them be, them, their marginalization in the press? Where were they? Oh, that's right. They were the ones doing the criticism. And now we have a black man named as the 20th Surgeon General of the United States. I haven't heard much from CNN and the rest of the mainstream media. Uh, the Negro progressives, they're, they're quiet. Uh, the so-called Congressional Black Caucus, I call them the Clown Brown Council, they're silent. And the Bisco types, also known as black and skin color only, they seem to have no clue at all what's going on. But the next time you hear about Colin Kaepernick, all of the above listed groups will be lit up like a Christmas tree. So here's the moral of the story. An educated black man following an educated black woman 
in reaching a lifetime achievement, because there's only been 20 of these Surgeon Generals in the history of the United States, that is less important to American blacks and the American media and the American left. It's less important than some dumb half-white boy who's sleeping with a mostly Arab claiming to be black chick who sucks at playing with the ball. That's a bigger concern. Or these two highly accomplished black people are less noteworthy in the minds of even other black people than Sloan Stevens, who does nothing but hit tennis balls. If you want to understand what's wrong with black people, why are they not touting Jerome Adams? Why are they not? Help me understand that. Why did they not tout and even defend Rear Admiral, two-star Admiral, two-star general type person, Sylvia Trent Adams, while she was acting as Surgeon General? Because you ain't black at all. You are nothing but lemmings of the white progressives who tell you what to think And they even have the audacity to tell you what black is and what black means. And you go for that okie doke. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking. We'll be back right after this. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking here on the dominant force in internet conservatism, TalkAmericaRadio.us. Also WDDQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia. WJHC Talk 107.5 in North Florida. Godspeed to them as they weather Irma. FreedomInAmericaRadio.com and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. I need to go ahead and add that the people in Georgia are going to be dealing with Irma as well, and they can use your prayers and support also. The topic is Michael Bennett, how he has now joined a not very exclusive nor a very positive list of people. On the 26th of August, after the Mayweather-McGregor circus, Bennett was in Las Vegas, and there was an incident at the casino or hotel or place where he was at the time. I'm not saying he was staying there, I don't know. But police were called to the scene because it was reported that somebody was shooting. Nobody said Michael Bennett was shooting. But the police showed up, guns drawn, looking to clear the area and deal with the fact that they had a report of somebody firing a weapon in the place. While they were there, they came across Michael Bennett. And apparently, he ran. Apparently. Now, Bennett has gone on to make some rather interesting claims against the LVMPD, which is the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, saying that they pulled a gun on him, put it to his head, and said they are going to blow his expletive head off. Well, that's interesting, but here's a report about Michael Bennett's accusation of the Las Vegas police. NFL star Michael Bennett on the ground, cuffed by a Las Vegas cop in video obtained by TMZ Sports. On Twitter today, Bennett claims the officer threatened to blow my expletive head off, jammed his knee into my back, and cinched the handcuff so tight that my fingers went numb. He said the encounter happened after Bennett attended the Floyd Mayweather Conor McGregor fight on August 26th and was heading back to his hotel. He said people heard what sounded like gunshots and ran. That's when he wrote, police singled me out and pointed their guns at me for doing nothing more than simply being a black man in the wrong place at the wrong time, adding, I thought of my girls, would I ever play with them again or kiss my wife again and tell her I love her. There's a lot of people who experienced what I experienced at that point, at that moment, and they're not here to live to tell their story. Bennett supported former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick's refusal to stand during the national anthem as a protest against police violence, sitting for the anthem himself last month. He has hired a prominent attorney. It's only because he is sort of rich and famous that he was able to walk away from this without going into custody uh, or even being mistreated any more so than he was. The Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department cautioned the public to reserve judgment and promised a fuller explanation. Ron Mott, NBC News. 
Michael Bennett is lying. Let me tell you why I think he's lying. One, where's the formal complaint against the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department by Michael Bennett for what he has put in writing that they have done? He hasn't submitted a complaint. He hasn't, he hasn't complained, except in the media. Hiring an attorney? So what? So now you can go you can go on about your business and you got this mouthpiece to do your talking for you while you are you know sitting during the national anthem at NFL games and then go play. There are 120 plus pieces of video that the police have been able to secure to this point and they're going through them all and they're soliciting more. So far, nothing that Michael Bennett has said about being called out of his name, having a gun drawn on him or pointed at his head, none of that has been borne out so far. Michael Bennett is not telling the truth. Now, for their part, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department Union has made it clear that they have a problem with Michael Bennett's statements. The union representing those officers is speaking out against Bennett and in support of the officers. The I team's Vanessa Murphy continues our team coverage with exclusive interview with the head of the union, Vanessa. Dave, Steve Grammis is president of the Las Vegas Police Protective Association. He wants an apology from Michael Bennett, and he's calling on the NFL to investigate the football player for, in his opinion, making false allegations. What would you say directly to Michael Bennett? I, I think you owe an apology to the men and women of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. I think that we can't be fanning the flames of racism and, and problems with the police based on a perception of what happens on a, on a call. Grandma says he first learned about Bennett's letter he tweeted earlier today, and as of this morning, no formal complaint was made by Bennett to the police department. Grandma has talked with both of those officers today. He says they deny those allegations, and they are shocked about what's unfolded. They feel horrible that they're being victimized, and they are being victimized right now in the media because they went out and did their job, and one person made a, a, a letter to the world that says, Dear World, that these officers violated his civil rights and things like that. I've reached out to the NFL since the union is calling for that investigation. So far, no response. No, the NFL did actually release a response, and uh, they said they're not going to do it. They're not going to investigate, and they are stating that, well, there's nothing that's going on that indicates that Michael Bennett engaged in any uh, conduct that violated his policy or the conduct policy uh, with the NFL, so we're not going to investigate. And the NFL is in a lose-lose position if they do anything about this other than just say, okay, Michael Bennett says something, we like Michael Bennett, let's go play football. That's all that's, that's, that's going to happen. And that's all that should happen from the NFL. They should not get into this. I would say they should not have even made the statement that they made in support of Michael Bennett. That was a political thing trying to turn off the criticism that's coming from the players who are 70% black. But Michael Bennett is lying and it's not he's not the first one who's lied. Lamar Lathan who used to play in the NFL um, lied about be, lied about somebody pointing a gun at him at a, at a traffic stop. That was back in September of 2015. The problem was a camera was on and demonstrated that he lied through his teeth. There was an Oakland uh, firefighter who was trying to play the victim card. <clears throat> Excuse me. Until he got jacked up by the police video. It's amazing. Keith Jones from Oakland, California. Uh, he and his sons were at a firehouse at a late time of night. The cops come up because they don't know what it is. The cops approach him, doesn't know what it is. He basically has a gun drawn. Once they identify themselves, he puts it away. Keith Jones says he did all kinds of things, and the video, the, the, the um, camera comes out and says, no, you, you're lying. 
And then all of a sudden, Keith Jones got real quiet. There is also a woman in Texas, Dorothy Bland, no relation to Sandra Bland, I, I don't believe, who was walking in the middle of the street, flailing her arms like some type of de- deranged bird, and the cops uh, came up behind her, uh, got out, did not arrest her, talked to her about walking on the sidewalk, as opposed to walking in the middle of the street, because she was blocking traffic. She was impeding traffic. And she went on to say how they were harassing her, all the while the dash cam was on and proved her to be a liar. What do these people have in common? Keith Jones, Dorothy Bland, Lamar Lathan, they're all black. And they're all feeding into this lie about increased police brutality toward blacks. CNN put out a um, very interesting article back in 2015. And the title says it all. We're not seeing more police shootings. We're just seeing more news coverage. The reason being the stuff about police brutality. The use of force or the threat of force has been 1.6% of all encounters between the police and the public since 1999 to present day. There is no increase. But what you can do is you can find every case because there are 40 to 70 million encounters every year. You're going to find something. You can find anything. Even out of, if, if it's 40 to 70 million, then 1% of that's a pretty big number. You'll find something. And you'll be able to put that out there and smear the police as much as you want. And that's what's happened. Michael Bennett is going, mark my words, Michael Bennett is going to have to walk away from this story. Whether or not he acknowledges that he's not telling the truth or whether it just dies some some ignoble death where no one talks about it anymore. Either way, he's not telling the truth. He's lying on the police so he can get his activism on. I'm going to turn this over to my good friend, Ron Edwards. And after that, we'll be back with hour two of Black Man Thinking. How moronic thinking can destroy a great nation. Hello, I'm Ron Edwards. On today's page from the Edwards Notebook, are leftists, career politicians like way out Maxine Waters, Chucky Schumer, and Representative Lee of California actually out of their natural minds or conscientiously in favor of a philosophical base that is destructive to our republic? Take DACA or the DREAM Act, for example. Thousands and thousands of illegal immigrants brought their children into our republic. I'm in America. <laughs> Now, there are at least 800,000 offspring, many of who are full-grown adults of up to 31 years of age. Considering the awful unemployment levels among young black American-born men and Hispanics, I find it very interesting that many leftist politicians and complaining academic professors are angry because the dreamers may have to obey the law and give up jobs they are taking from American youths who need to find employment. Those of the moronic left or ridiculous rhino ranks in the legislative branch should themselves be booted out of office and replaced with statesmen and women who will govern on behalf of our republic and will support efforts to convince other nations to adopt free market economics and stop filling our nation with American haters who have no intention of becoming Americans. I'm Ron Edwards. Sponsored by the Tri-County Liberty Coalition. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. 
black men thinking. Anytime you throw your weight behind a political party that controls two thirds of the government, and that party can't keep the promise that it made to you during election time, and you are dumb enough to walk around continuing to identify yourself with that party, you're not only a chump, but you're a traitor to your race. Black men thinking. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. And this idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no other source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and the most unique idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. Black men thinking, thinking. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Black men thinking. Stanley Levy, thinking, Black Man Thinking, here thinking. on the dominant force of Internet Conservative. Talk America Radio. US. Also, WDDQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia. WJHC, Talk 107.5 in North Florida. Freedom in America Radio.com and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. And again, thoughts and prayers going out to those in Florida and Georgia as Irma continues her visitation. New subject. Um, We're going to talk a little bit about the Trump effect. And the Trump effect is really disturbing to progressives because they only have one way to interpret it because they only have one way of seeing things. America is supposed to be anti-white to compensate for everything that white people have done against the masses in America. Uh, Whites are against blacks. Of course, they ended slavery. They ended Jim Crow laws. They elected a black president. You have blacks in leadership positions, blacks with plenty of money. 70% of the NFL is black. The NFL is the most popular sport. But, of course, whites are responsible for tremendous hard Uh, hardship and damage, not only in the United States, not only in the present day, but throughout the annals of time. So the Trump effect, which basically says white people are no better or worse than anyone else, and they deserve to be heard no differently than anyone else, is anathema to them. The Trump effect says white people no longer need to apologize for that which they did not do, or for what others perceive they are doing, of which they have no awareness whatsoever. What about white privilege? What white privilege? More more, more poor white folk in, uh, in this country than of any other type. So where's the white privilege? How come they're not stepping on everyone else and replacing every poor white person with a poor person of color so that we can reduce the number of white people? That's not happening. Well, what about systemic racism? Then how did you how do you elect all these black people into office? How do you have all these blacks in Congress? How do you have a black president for two terms? How do you have blacks running major cities in these in these United States, at least up till recently when people got tired of Negro foolishness in city in City Hall, uh, like in Detroit? But they ran blacks ran Detroit for decades. Blacks are still running cities like Baltimore, like, oh, I'm sorry, New Orleans got tired of them as well. Philadelphia, oh, they got tired of them in Philadelphia as well. The idea that there is a systemic racism that keeps blacks from achieving something is ridiculous. Nevertheless, it is stirring up pushback against the idea that whites cannot express themselves as freely in these United States as the quote-unquote oppressed people can, that is the Trump effect. Well, that's, that, that's racism. No. In a free country, you don't have to agree with someone else to have a right to speak. If, that, if we were going to make that requirement, then you should have shut down Colin Kaepernick long time ago, but you did not, and you applaud him for speaking, that's a different story or a different topic. In this case, the the Trump effect is dealing with a woman named Lynn Orletsky, who was 
a high school teacher in Georgia until very recently. Wait, so both of them, both of them have to like flip their shirts inside out because it says Trump on the top. They gotta flip their shirts inside out because it's got Trump on it and it's supported by me. Okay. Okay. So the female voice that you heard was that of Lynn Oletsky equating Make America Great, she couldn't bring herself to say it, equating that slogan with a swastika and saying that it could not be worn. Well, she now knows how, she, how far she went. Well, I don't care what you do in other classes, but in my class you cannot wear uh, a shirt that has that slogan. Okay. Well, she seems to have been fired, according to Turning Point News. Lynn Orletsky, the Georgia high school math teacher that Turning Point News and Turning Point USA exposed for comparing Trump t-shirts to swastika, was terminated from her position. And they release a picture of a letter from the high school and the letter says the purpose of this correspondence is to provide you with an update on your child's math cl- math class and it's signed by the school principal it reads miss orletsky is no longer your child's math teacher effective immediately the letter also informs that the school is searching for an experienced educator to teach these classes for the rest of the school year that would strongly suggest that miss orletsky is gone So, that's a blow on a number of levels. That's a blow against progressives in general, and that would be a blow against progressivism in the classroom, which has had almost no checks for at least the last 20 years. So, is, well, she's just one crackpot. Well, you know what? Let me help you out. Crackpots don't just pop up. You have to develop them. Here is some video or the audio of an encounter on a college campus where liberal students are opposing a more conservative student for wearing a Make America Great hat. You got to hear this to believe it. It's a public place. Public place. Make America Great Again hat. She's completely freaking out. You're allowed to film whatever. Support a political candidate. You're not allowed to share hate language in this, the university. I'm saying make America What is hate language, language about that? What is hate language about that? You don't care. I want to hear Make America great again means make America all for white people, no immigrants, no people of no, different sexual orientation. His, his wife is an immigrant. His wife is an immigrant. That illegal. doesn't mean anything. How is it not? You just said no immigrants. It doesn't mean anything. I could have a brother who's gay and I could not be supporting gay people. It doesn't mean anything. Your value so why is he so say, You just say he doesn't like immigrants. His wife's an immigrant. It's le- illegal immigrants that he doesn't like. You're not even connecting. How? What's it? You're saying he, I asked you, does he not like immigrants? You're like, he doesn't like immigrants. Just because he's married to an immigrant doesn't mean that his policies and what he stands for is promoting people of different colors being in our It's illegal immigrants. Just keep wearing that, man. That's awesome. He doesn't Thanks. hate anyone. Yeah, no. Illegal immigrants. Illegal. Illegal immigrants. Listen, dude, like, we're friends and I level with you, but, like, you've got to take the hat off. Or I'm going to rate the president of the university and he's going to come and talk to you because I already talked to him about this. It's not allowed. It's hate language on campus. You can deal with me or you can deal with David Doherty. I waited to talk to you in person and I've already talked to him about this. You can laugh because it's so going to happen. And I can't wait for him to come He's to wearing a hat that he wants to wear. What is wrong with the I'm hat? I'm not what allowed to wear a shirt. I'm not allowed to wear a shirt. Yeah, no, it's not. Yo, let's go. This is ridiculous. Hey, You're you all this is just now and you can make America great again. It's a hat. He's wearing a hat. It's Trump doesn't hat. hate it's immigrants. So so it's so how is it so much more? You don't know anything about Trump. You don't know anything. You don't know one little thing. Okay. Please. Keep wearing the hat, man. Keep wearing the hat. 
That is insane. This is all on camera. Yo, keep wearing that hat. If I had my Trump stuff, this girl is just Dude, so you if you want me to come off. talk to David, I will. You gotta take Make it America, off. Why does he have to take it off? Do me because a favor, please. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Just please stop. 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 Yo, give him the hat back. Now, the profuse thanks you heard was because some little snowflakey uh, pencil neck white guy um, had the audacity and, and the temerity to snatch the hat off the guy's head and then go hide behind people and then tell people to leave. Um, These are the people at college campuses who go out into the workforce and end up in high schools and colleges as educators. So Lynn Orletsky is not some one-off individual She is simply a previous crop. They're still growing them on college campuses. They're still growing these nut jobs on college campuses. The Trump effect is finally getting real opposition to stand up and tell these people no. It's going to take a while for it to become very effective. But more than anything else, it is very apparent now. The Trump effect is taking all of political correctness and saying no. If you're not putting Americans first, and oh by the way, just because I'm a white American doesn't mean I don't get to go first with every other American. If you're not putting Americans first, I have the right to say that you are not correct. I have the right to say that you're thought process, your policies, your attitudes are not reflective of America and they definitely don't represent me. Now, the question becomes, how far can this go? This depends a lot on what the people who are not on college campuses but who find themselves borrowing money to pay for someone's college campus experience finally has to say about how their country is represented on campus and in the classroom. When the silent majority finally decides to clear its throat about Americanism in education, then you will see that people like Lynn Orletsky or like the young lady in that video who was so adamant about having someone take off a hat, That's when they will be shut down, and they should be shut down. They can speak, but they should no longer prevail. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, will be back right after this. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, here on the dominant force of Internet Conservatism, TalkAmericaRadio.us, also WDDQ Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia. WJHC Talk 107.5 in North Florida. FreedomInAmericaRadio.com and WLBV News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. And I will continue to ask for you to give your prayers and support for those who are in Georgia and Florida dealing with Hurricane Irma. Topic now, um, the Justice Department is now coming out on the side of religious liberty and religious freedom. Back in 2012, a gentleman by the name of Jack Phillips was asked by a homosexual couple to make a cake for their wedding. And he said, no. A cake controversy. One couple says they just wanted a wedding cake. A bakery owner says he wants nothing to do with the cake for their same-sex marriage. Matt Flanner reports. I opened Masterpiece Cake Shop in September 1993. You get it? Okay. It's a small shop. It's like the size of a three-car garage. Icing like that, we make all the icing and everything from scratch. Jack Phillips is not quite your mix from a box kind of a guy. Give me 15 minutes and you too can be making a rose. 
custom creations are his specialty. This whole thing boils down to just the one cake, one item of the cake. Except for one cake two weeks ago, he did not want to make. You know, white on the outside, some red and teal swirls on the side, because those are our wedding colors. And then, Dave uh, Mullins and Charlie Craig made a simple request. We just wanted a wedding cake. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't do cakes for same-sex weddings. Everyone deserves the cake! So two weeks later, after Dave and Charlie told a few thousand of their Facebook friends, the world soon knew about what happened. It's been really stunning and heartwarming to see how many people have stood up to support us. Yet the same support is there. Oh, this is wonderful. Chocolatey, oh, great. For this small little cake shop. So many people have called me and come in. And We're standing up for him, and we're standing up for his business. And there is no doubt the layers of this protest will continue to add on. As the custom creations here are now filled with debate. And I wouldn't pick them out and say, I'm not going to do your cake because you're gay. I'm just not going to participate in your wedding cake. We're not trying to shut down Masterpiece Cake Shop. We want Masterpiece Cake Shop's policy toward gays and weddings, gay weddings, to change. And there is no reason for that policy to change. The issue would be if there were no one who was willing to make their cake. The idea that someone must give you service simply because you ask for it for something as unnecessary as a cake. I could understand it better, although I would still have the same objections, if you went to a doctor and demanded treatment. And if he said, I don't treat people who are homosexuals, obviously that's a much bigger issue because now you're talking about matters of life and death. All we're talking about here is emotional butthurt. You don't like us? You don't like what we're doing? We'll get the government on you. That was pretty much the case. Mr. Phillips ended up having significant problems with that. Yes, there was support. Let me say something about the support. It breaks down on two lines. It breaks down on age lines because real Americans tend to be older. Not all of them, but they tend to be older. And real Americans look at this and say, this is this is nonsense. You don't demand that somebody make something that they fundamentally disagree with doing. That's called infringement upon their freedom. And then you have the younger folks who have been taught by a progressive education system that anything you want to do should be supported by everybody else, no matter how they perceive it. That's one group. Then there's also, of course, the progressive American breakdown. Americans simply understand that you don't have to serve anybody. You can walk into most businesses still and see a sign on the wall that says, no shoes, no shirt, no service. Well, you're infringing, you're, you're denying me, you're discriminating against me because I don't like to wear certain clothes. There's no difference. Well, that could be a hygiene thing. Really? You want to talk about homosexuality and hygiene at the same time? Really? Okay. I don't know why you want to do that or if you want to do that, but okay. The case went on because Mr. Phillips did not simply acquiesce to what was requested of him. And in 2014, you have this update. New developments now involving a Lakewood bakery accused of discriminating against a gay couple by refusing to sell them a wedding cake. Well, the state civil rights commission says that bakery did violate discrimination laws. Suzanne McCarroll was there for today's ruling, joins us now on both sides in this case. We're there too, Suzanne. They were both there, that's for sure. You know, this may be Colorado's most famous bakery, but not for the quality of its sweets, but rather for the baker's stand on gay marriage. The wedding cakes at Masterpiece Cake Shop are detailed and attractive. The conflict between some customers and the owner has become ugly and complicated. Then we closed down the bakery before we uh, compromise our beliefs. He says he doesn't believe in gay marriage and refused to make this marrying gay couple a wedding cake. We've already been discriminated against there. We were already treated badly. A judge ruled that a business owner cannot refuse service to a customer on the basis of sexual preference. And that decision was upheld today by the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. The owner says he will now no longer make any wedding cakes. What if somebody comes in and orders cupcakes for a gay birthday party? If it's uh, just a birthday, I have no problem with that. Uh, my issue is that I don't want to be forced to participate in a same-sex wedding. 
This commission is also ordering the baker to submit quarterly reports on who he refuses to serve and how he retrains his employees to serve all customers. At the moment, I'm just completely overwhelmed in emotions. For David Mullins and Charlie Craig, today is a very sweet victory. The next time a gay couple wanders in there asking for a wedding cake, they won't have the experience that we have. The owner of that bakery is now looking into the possibility of appealing today's decisions. So many foolish statements in there. You heard the last thing from the uh, homosexual who got married uh, saying, well, the next gay couple won't have our experience. Yes, they will. Jack Phillips is not going to make your cake. He's not going to make anybody's wedding cake. Therefore, you can't say you're being discriminated against. He's discriminating against everybody getting married. As I don't make wedding cakes. So the next couple that walks in would have the same experience as you. You would not get a wedding cake from that gentleman. The idea that the government is going to have you submit quarterly reports and tell you and monitor who you service in your business. Now, the government does not produce anything except rules, sometimes bogus rules like this. And the reason you have a constitution is not to get rid of discrimination, but it is to protect people's rights that are granted them by God. And one of the rights that you would be granted by God is freedom of association. I deal with who I want to deal with. Well, if you open a business, no, it doesn't change anything. I'm still me running that business. I deal with who I want to deal with for the reasons that I want to deal with them. Well, that's not fair. That's not your call. Well, then you'd say that, 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 that discrimination against blacks is that the question is not whether or not they did something against you because they don't like you. The question is, how are you harmed if you have someplace else to go to get the same product? And I would dare say whether you are black or homosexual or pick your particular quote unquote oppressed group. Just because one person says no doesn't mean you can't get the very same thing for more than likely the same quality or perhaps even better from someplace else. And as long as that is the case, how are you harmed? And I notice that nobody does this with Muslims. Nobody walks into there because they know the Muslims are not going to do a, a homosexual cake. They're not going to do it. But I haven't seen anybody walk into there and drag Muslims before. It's always Christians. It's always Christian florists, Christian bakers, Christian photographers. It's never the Muslims. And you know the Muslims are like, if they're devout, the answer is not no, but heck no. Interesting. Nevertheless, we are progressing. Because after all the bad news Jack Phillips has received in this case for the better part of five years, well, there was an election in 2016 that made things different for him. Thank you. And as a result of that, this is going to happen. A Colorado case we have been following for years is now headed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. A baker in Lakewood refused to make a wedding cake for a gay couple, arguing that it violated his religious beliefs. Political special Sean Boyd talked to that baker, joins us live outside his Lakewood bakery or inside his Lakewood bakery with what's new with this case tonight, Sean. You know, Karen, depending on how the court rules, this could be a landmark case. It pits religious liberties against civil liberties and is one of several similar cases around the country that challenge anti-discrimination laws that some say violate First Amendment rights. Masterpiece cake shop owner Jack Phillips was overcome by emotion after learning the nation's highest court would take up his case. And she called right a minute after that. Did you hear? Yeah, and I can't breathe. The case of Masterpiece Cake Shop versus the Colorado Civil Rights Commission began five years ago when Charlie Craig and Dave Mullins asked Phillips to make a cake for their wedding reception. Phillips refused, saying his cakes are artistic expression and creating a cake celebrating gay marriage violates his religious beliefs. I create a canvas, I also create the paints, and then I create the art. American citizens should not be compelled um, to create expression or to say things that they... Are that are deeply at odds with their beliefs. But the ACLU argues Colorado law bars any business open to the public from refusing service based on sexual orientation. Religious freedom does not give you the right to discriminate. The case will be decided by a Supreme Court that now includes Colorado Judge Neil Gorsuch, who in previous rulings has erred on the side of religious liberty. But Craig and Mullen say they're hopeful. We strongly believe in 
the institution of the Supreme Court. And we believe that they will treat this case with the same gravity that they treat all the cases. Now, if the court rules against Craig and Mullins, it not only means that bakers can refuse cakes for gay marriages, but florists and photographers also consider artists can refuse wedding services. As an indication of the court's leaning in a separate case today, it ruled that religious institutions can receive government money for non-religious uses. Live in Lakewood, Sean Boyd, CBS4 News. If you're going to say there's a contest between religious liberties and civil liberties, that is no contest, civil liberties clearly fall behind if you read the Constitution. You cannot, if someone appeals to the Supreme Court, appeals to the federal government as a citizen of the United States saying that someone is saying is coming up with civil liberties that trump my religious liberties, the Constitution is clear. You can't do that. I love a quote that is ascribed to Benjamin Franklin coming up with the difference between liberty and democracy. Democracy is two wolves and a lamb deciding what to have for lunch. Liberty is a well-armed lamb protesting the vote. Liberty is not having the majority tell you how you must conduct your affairs. Liberty is you telling the majority, I will live in your midst But this is the way I will conduct my affairs. And if that offends you, don't deal with me. But I don't have to change. That is liberty. Now, the Trump administration makes this case much more interesting because they put Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court, which now means that you are more likely in a close decision to have at least one more vote side with traditional liberties that are outlined in the Constitution. And then a few days ago, the Justice Department did this. The Justice Department filed a brief supporting a baker who refused to make a wedding cake for a same-sex couple in a case headed to the Supreme Court. The DOJ filed the brief on September 7th on behalf of Jack Phillips, who was found to have violated the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Act by refusing to create a wedding cake for Charlie Craig and David Mullins in 2012. Phillips said creating a wedding cake for a same-sex couple would violate his religious beliefs. Acting Solicitor General Jeffrey Wall wrote in the brief, quote, forcing Phillips to create expression for and participate in a ceremony that violates his sincerely held religious beliefs, invades his First Amendment rights. Louise Melling, the deputy legal counsel of the American Civil Liberties Union, which is representing the couple, called the DOJ's position, quote, nothing short of shocking. The Supreme Court will hear oral arguments in its new term, which starts in November. For United News International from Washington, D.C., I'm Caitlin Mangum. I will be watching that case personally with great interest. Jack Phillips should prevail. No one should be forced to run their business according to arbitrary dictates of the government to appease political correctness. It should not. And for all those who are talking about racial discrimination, let me help you out. By and large, that is not our issue in this country anymore. Well, they, you don't know. I've lived in the South. I grew up in the South. I've lived in various places around this country. Are there people who do not like black people who look like me? Of course. Will there always be? Of course. Are there even those who run businesses who would, who would not serve me? Of course. Is there anything that I would want of the highest quality in this country that I cannot buy if I have the money to do so? The answer is No. And that has not always been the case in this country if you were black. So I'm not trying to hear that nonsense. And I won't hear it. Jack Baker should prevail. Everyone who is trying to be obedient to God should be able to run all of their affairs in accordance with that belief. I don't have to agree with their belief but I don't have the right to violate it and call myself an American. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking. We'll be back right after this. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, here on the dominant force in Internet conservatism, 
TalkAmericaRadio.us. Also, WDDQ Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia. WJHC Talk 107.5 North Florida Radio. FreedomInAmerica.com and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. And I will continue to solicit your thoughts and prayers for those in Florida and Georgia who are dealing with Hurricane Irma. Well, the EPA loses weight. According to the Wall Street Journal, hundreds of workers leave the EPA in recent days. Nearly 400 employees have left the agency since August 31st, with most of the departures coming through buyouts. Wow. The departures come primarily from buyouts offered as part of President Donald Trump's efforts to fulfill a campaign promise of tremendous cutting at the EPA. This is a campaign promise being fulfilled. His budget proposal in March suggested a 31% funding cut that would result in approximately 3,200 fewer jobs at the agency. The voluntary buyouts were offered in June to more than 1,200 workers, and almost a third of those eligible took the buyout, and coupled with a dozen retirements on August 31st, the agency trimmed its staff by about 2.5% in less than a week. Several dozen more workers could retire or opt to take the buyout later this month, which would cut the EPA's total number of employees to almost 14,400 workers, the lowest level since 1988. Wow. Why is that important? Well, Marcellus Drilling News put out an article some time ago, Fixing the Nearly Unfixable EPA, Abuses, Collusion, and Cover-Ups. The Federal Environmental Protection Agency has been a rogue agency for years under the previous Obama administration. To be fair, the agency has been a problem long before that, pretty much since its inception. And it wasn't a Democrat who cooked up the EPA. It was Richard Nixon. Now that Trump is president, he's attempting to rein in the EPA by trimming its budget and focusing it on its original intent to clean up America's air and water. Now that he's doing that, leftists are having a cow. In a devastating column published by Dr. Jack Refuse, a former White House energy advisor, Refuse exposes some of the egregious collusion and criminal cover-ups perpetrated by the EPA. He lays bare the swamp that needs draining at the EPA, providing justification for Trump's actions in reigning in this rogue agency. If you really cared, you could go through all the things the EPA has done, keeping people from being able to use their property for the most ridiculous reasons. Someone cut down a tree and it happened to block a brook on their property and they were not allowed to remove it to continue developing their property because now they had formed a water ecosystem and they didn't want to hurt. Things like this are not unheard of. With Along with fines that the EPA can unilaterally levy that can be into the thousands and sometimes tens of thousands of dollars per day and you have to go and petition to have the fine stop the EPA does not have to do anything other than think that you're in the wrong to levy the fines there is no more anti-liberty organization in the government than the EPA it violates rights every day that it exists Now, the interesting thing is I like how Trump has gone about it. I'm not going to go in there and cut all the regulations. I'm not going to go in there and do. I'm going to simply cut your staff. Two and a half percent in less than a week. 3,200 jobs overall. 
No matter what your government function is, if you don't have the people to pull it off, you're not going to enforce anything, whether it be law or regulation. This, to me, is part of Trump's genius. And that's the only way for me to describe it. It is absolute genius. Here's something from the uh, the essay that they spoke about from John Refuse. Trump's budget guidance sought to cut $1.6 billion from the EPA's $8.1 billion expectation. No promise. Shrieks of looming Armageddon prompted Congress to fund the EPA in full until September 2017, and then we're going to have the battle again. The EPA is going to lose money. It's going. To, it's already losing weight. That's what should happen. And you should be ecstatic if you are an American. If you are a property owner, you should be ecstatic. If you're simply a progressive who wants to dictate to people how they use what they have for your benefit at no risk to you and all risk to them, then, of course, you are howling. But then again, the EPA has only been around since 1970. You didn't need it for almost the first 200 years of the country. You just really don't need it now. But Donald Trump, for all the things that he's doing to try to drain the swamp, I would be shocked if he actually sought to get rid of the EPA, which I believe is what should be done. Well, you say we want dirty air and water. Tell me the governor who wants dirty air and water in his state. Point him out to me. Point out the state legislature that wants dirty air and water in their state. Point them out to me. Well, what about Michigan? Nobody wanted that. That's called government mess up. And the EPA is part of that mess up. They knew about the situation and didn't tell anybody for six months. They're not helpful. It's just another government bureaucracy that produces nothing but impediments for people who want to live free. And Donald Trump is going about hitting them in a way that they cannot fight back. I'll simply take your people away and then we'll see what you can do. It's brilliant. And it's draining the swamp. And this is one of the bigger gators that are in there. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, we'll be back right after this. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, here on the dominant force of internet conservatism, TalkAmericaRadio.us, also WDDQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia, WJHC, Talk 107.5, North Florida, Talk Radio, FreedomInAmericaRadio.com, and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. And again, I solicit your thoughts and prayers for those in Florida and Georgia dealing with Hurricane Irma. Uh, Final segment of the show, and we're going to talk a little bit about Black Lives Matter foolishness. First of all, you have to understand that it is foolishness. Black Lives Matter is a lie. And the way they deal with you not nailing it down as a lie is there are two Black Lives Matter organizations or, or presentations. There is the one that is perpetuated by the so-called upscale progressive blacks and what I call the clueless black community that all we want is the hashtag to matter to think what we think it think it, it should be. We, we just think it means black lives matter, whatever that is. And we, we, we have a problem with police violence. None of this is none of this is based on data. All of this is based on perception, emotion and the fact that it's not that there is more police violence against blacks, it's police violence against blacks is more reported than police violence against anyone else. Whites deal with more police violence than any other demographic. And and the American Indian population, from a proportion standpoint, deals with more police violence than anybody. But you don't hear about them because that does not fit a progressive narrative that needs race to divide the country. So you have that Black Lives Matter that's being very reasonable and talking about systemic 
uh, racism and white privilege. And then you have the real Black Lives Matter that goes and causes riots in Ferguson and in Baltimore, that goes into New York and chants, what do we want dead cops? Where, when do we want them now? And assaults police officers there. An organization that goes into Texas and talks about pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. That is also Black Lives Matter. It is also an organization that has basic, I, I'm sorry, they're responsible for the deaths of police officers. The five police officers who died in Dallas would not have died had it not been for Black Lives Matter. They're responsible for black deaths. After they agitated in Baltimore, homicides in Baltimore went to a rate where they had more homicides in Baltimore than you had in New York City that same year. And New York City is 13 times the population of Baltimore. So that other Black Lives Matter, the one that's more realistic, is also represented by a woman named Charlene he Chanel, excuse me, Chanel Helm, who is a Black Lives Matter of Louisville organizer. She recently published 10 requests for white people. I'm just going to read you the list. Number one, white people, if you don't have descendants, will your pop property to a black or brown family, preferably one that lives in generational poverty. White people, number two, if you're inheriting property you intend to sell upon acceptance, give it to a black or brown family, you're bound to make that money in some other white privileged way. Three, if you're a developer or realty owner of multifamily housing, build a sustainable complex in a black or brown blighted neighborhood, I don't know how you're gonna do that, and let black and brown people live in it for free. So how's it gonna be sustainable? First of all, it's in a blighted community, and then you're not going to get any rent. Okay, never mind. White people, number four. If you can afford to downsize, give up the home you own to a black or brown family, preferably a family from generational poverty. Number five. White people, if any of you intend to leave your property, uh, excuse me, if any of the people you intend to leave your property to are racist, change the will and will your property to a black or brown family, preferably a family from generational poverty. So if you, Chanel, don't like my family and I'm a white person, then I should not pass on my wealth to my family. I should give it to, right. Number six, white people, rebudget your monthly expenses so you can donate to black funds for land purchasing because blacks definitely can't get their own money. White people, especially white women, because this is y'all specialty. Nosy Jenny and meddling Kathy. Get a racist fired. Y'all know what the stuff they be do, doing and saying. You are complicit when you ignore them. Get your boss fired because they racist too. Eight, backing up number seven, this should be easy. But all those sheetless clan Nazis and other small-membered white men will all be returning to work. Get them fired. Call the police even. They look suspicious. Nine, backing up number eight. If any white person at your work or as you enter in spaces and you overhear a white person praising the actions from yesterday, and she's speaking about the uh, actions in Charlottesville uh, during that protest, first get a pick, get their name and more info, find out where they work, get them fired, but certainly address them. And if you need to, you got hands, use them. So she's advocating for violence. Go beat them up. If they like what happened yesterday, go beat them up. 10. Commit to two things, fighting white supremacy where and how you can. This doesn't mean taking up knitting unless you're making scarves for black and brown kids in need. And funding black and brown people and their work. So, what she just said is that black people are incapable of economic advancement on their own. Never mind the fact that six decades ago, and even through that time, as many blacks went backwards as they became subject to and believers in progressive ideology, black people owned businesses, owned lands, became political leaders, president of the United States, and they have become CEOs of major companies and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, have opened and sustained their own businesses. But they can't do that in Chanel Helm's world. This is her thinking of black. Well, she talked about uh, generational poverty. She said preferably. She didn't care. She doesn't think any blacks can do well unless white folks do for them 
or give up stuff for them. Got it. I got it. Now, she went and had a discussion with a gentleman, Jeffrey Mark Klein, I believe his name to be, about her list. And he reached some interesting conclusions with her. Now, a Black Lives Matter activist has come up with a solution to racial inequality in the U.S. Chanel Helm, the movement's organizer in Kentucky, wrote an article making 10 suggestions for white people. The first says they should leave their property to minorities if they don't have any descendants. The list also urges readers to record people who make racist comments in the workplace and get them fired. We asked Helm about the initiative and also invited comment from political activist Jeffrey Klein. One of the later numbers of the 10 suggestions was to essentially seek out Nazis in the workplace and get them fired. And uh, the word Nazi has been so watered down lately that I don't think anybody really knows what it means anymore. Let's remember where the word Nazi even comes from. It comes from Germanic people who were uh, in, who proclaimed to like have this superior race. That's what white supremacy is. That's what white supremacy is in the U.S. We are talking about a systemic economic barrier that prevents black and brown people, black and brown people who are, were already on this land from even obtaining land in various different ways. The main issue we're talking about here is there's black people who've never been slaves asking for money from white people who've never owned slaves. And so it's difficult for me to be able to wrap my brain around owing somebody something when I clearly don't owe them anything. And the notion that the, that the list of 10 things wasn't racist when, it's, when all it's doing is talking about race, the list is essentially implying that black and brown people are incapable of achieving economic growth. And as a result, white people need to give them economic advantages. I think it's very racist against black and brown people to essentially tell them they're not capable of this. I think that it's dangerous in a sense to say that what I wrote was, was, was racist or uh, dangerous because it wasn't in the least and none of what I wrote was dangerous in the least I think what's dangerous is the backlash that I am personally receiving from that um, in one of the points you even say uh, something to the effect of you have hands colon use them <laughs> very much uh, hearkening back to this overused phrase right now about punching Nazis and when we talk about Nazis and punching Nazis we are talking about white supremacy white supremacy did deal some of the most deadliest types of genocide that our world has ever seen. So I, we're not talking about something that's just in a tin list of things. And when I'm talking about using your hands, because Nazis are violent. It's perpetuating a lot of this racial tension. It's furthering the divide between races, which I think, if anything, we should be trying to come together. And uh, it is encouraging some level of violence. And it's very naive to act like you don't think it. Well, actually, it's not naive. Um, you have to understand just how unhinged Black Lives Matter is. This is what they think. They are part of the liberal, progressive, globalist fringe. That's who and what they are. And the most interesting thing about this is the large number of female homosexuals that are in strategic positions, leadership positions in that organization, as though that is somehow representative of black people in America. It is not. Now, back in July of 2016, CNN, as they are wont to do, they wanted to present the other side of Black Lives Matter, the quote-unquote reasonable side. How can you argue with the hashtag uh, side? And Gary McCarthy, who's the former um, supervisor of police for Chicago, was also um, there in this group, in this meeting. And here is how he spoke during a portion of that gathering. Rudy Giuliani recently made the assertion that Black Lives Matter movement, a movement that is grounded in notions of respect, dignity, justice, and sanctity of life, sanctity of black life. He noted that this was inherently racist. I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Gary McCarthy, you, what do you think Black Lives Matter? Do you agree with the former mayor of New York City, Rudy Giuliani? Well, I, I can tell you this. I think if there was a movement called White Lives Matter, it would be considered racist. So I think that all lives matter. I spent 35 years. As a matter of fact, today is my 35th anniversary as a police officer, yeah. starting here in New York City. And for 35 years, I've been trying to reduce crime and stop murders. And it didn't matter if they were black, white, green, or purple. So I, I'm a believer that we got to get by the, the differences. we got to have an honest conversation, which I hope this is going to open up to be. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we have to have exposure 
to each other, and we have to sit down and really rip at this thing and get, get after it. Do you, do, do, uh, let, uh, just applause. People who believe that, uh, that Black Lives Matter is uh, racist and offensive. If you believe there was a White Lives Matter, would it be considered racist? Applause. You think it would be considered racist? Upon the data. There's, no reason, there's no reason for them. They don't need a White Lives Matter. Because wait, wait. It's, it's already it's already understood that but white the data, lives the matter. Data says that the hold, 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 hold on one second. Hold on one second. So I'm, I'm going to use a very simple analogy. If you and I went to the store and both of us ha ordered hamburgers and they gave you yours and they gave Bishop Jake's his and I didn't get mine, is it is it discrimination? Is it racist because I say where is my burger? But then you turn around and you say all burgers matter. Well, I'm glad you have yours. Well, what about mine? Okay, go ahead, <laughs> Gary. Let, I, Gary. I'm sorry, Tom, but the data that you put up showed that the police have shot more white people this year. Than they have black folks. Hold on. Hold on. Now, by the way, I'm not dismissing the issue in no way, shape, or form. Am I doing it? I'm merely presenting an alternative thought. That's but, but, he, but listen, hang on, everybody. He thinks that you are dismissing his issue by by saying that. Are you listening? Do you do you hear Absolutely, what he's saying? I'm listening. Do you hear him? Absolutely, I'm yeah. listening. The problem with listening to Black Lives Matter advocates is the only way you can agree with them is to ignore the data. White people get shot more often. White people are more victimized by police violence than blacks. And when you take into consideration the per, the per capita propensity of blacks to engage in criminal activity, including violent criminal activity, you can't justify it simply by a density of population that favors whites. This is the issue. And the analogy that young man gave made no sense. Well, you got your burger and I didn't get mine. No, it doesn't make any sense. And then he threw Bishop T.D. Jakes in there just because. Didn't make any difference. So, you're going to have to understand that this is a terrible movement. And the only way to deal with it is to shut it down. If you have to do so forcibly, then you do. Then you do. And that's going to be not just white people. It can be, but it won't be. Because there are a lot of people of color who do not agree with Black Lives Matter. And that's our show. Remember those who are dealing with terrible weather, both in Florida and Georgia and still in Texas. And unfortunately, there's another hurricane, Jose, on the way. Remember to take care of those for whom you care. Take care of yourselves, and I hope to see you next week. You've been listening to Black Man Thinking with your host, Stan Levy. Join Stan midnight to 2 a.m. That's late Monday night into early Tuesday morning. And find him on the web at Black Man Thinking without the G. That's blackmanthinking.com. Thinking.com.